Good afternoon, Marines. Good afternoon, sir. It's great to be with you this afternoon. My name is Chaplain Dupre, and I'm going to be speaking to you this afternoon about suicide prevention, but in a little bit different way than you're used to. This training set that we're going to do today is designed to build upon the principles of UMAPIT, which is the standard Marine Corps training. It stands for Unit Marine Awareness and Prevention Integrated Training. This is designed not to replace that, but to be built upon that so we get to think about the terms of UMAPIT in a little bit more of a creative way and an interactive way. All right, so this is a model, an intervention model, that I hope that you can use at fire, as fire team leaders not only to intervene for those at risk for suicide, but for those at risk for anything that would be a destructive behavior to hurt themselves or anyone else. Okay, good to go? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So I've asked for a few volunteers to come up and help me out. So if I could get the first four volunteers to come up and take their places. What I want to do is I want to build my, my version of a PowerPoint, okay? So I'm not, uh, I'm not a PowerPoint guy. I don't like to use a lot of PowerPoints. I'd rather use people when I can. I'd like to draw a picture that hopefully you will remember really indefinitely as you go forward. Okay, so what I want to do with my PowerPoint that I'm building with these four Marines, thank you very much. You can relax a little bit. All right, and, and what I want to do is I want to build a spectrum that's going to go from left to right, okay? And this gentleman right here, this Marine, is going to represent thought. What does he represent? Thought. Excellent. Help me out a little bit more. What does he represent? Thought. Perfect. This Marine represents language. What does she represent? Language. This Marine represents action. What does he represent? Action. And this Marine represents the culminating event, okay? What does he represent? Okay, the reason why I say culminating event is because we might not be talking about suicide or death by suicide. We might be talking about something else. That's why we call it spectrum mapping, and that's why we need to be listening very carefully over here to figure out where is this person at risk going so that we can get them the proper help. Okay, so again, once more, what does he represent? Uh, and she? Language. And he? Action. And he? Okay, perfect, the culminating event. Now, let me ask you this question. Where do you think, I think, you should intervene in the life of the person at risk? Where? At language, at language. okay, awesome. Any other ideas? At action, okay, that's a good idea too. At thought, okay, perfect. Now, could we agree we want to intervene as far to the left as possible? You agree? Yeah, so sometimes we might not know until action is taken, so that's where the intervention takes place. But we hope that, again, if we're doing fire team leadership like we care about it, and if we're willing to be inconvenienced for the life of the Marines around us, we're going to catch it right in here as, as thought turns into language and is considering some kind of an action. So we just want to always think as far to the left as possible. However, it doesn't move along necessarily along a quick and easy line because we have things like, first volunteer, come right on up. All right, what I want you to do is just kind of give them a little bit of one of these right here. Yes, sir. Okay, he is going to represent an accelerator. Okay, because the problem is that for those at risk, we have accelerators that move us, have a tendency to move us quickly along the spectrum. And can we agree that would be dangerous if there were accelerators, right? He is alcohol. Okay, that's what he represents. Can you see how alcohol would be an accelerator? Yes, sir. Have you experienced that before? Let's take it out of suicide prevention. Let's go to sexual assault. Okay, we're out. We're partying. We're bringing on a lot of alcohol on board. Okay, and one of your buddies says to you, and I'll just, I'll pick on the guys, okay? Uh, so one of your buddies says to you, man, I would really like to get that girl drunk and get laid tonight. Okay? Now, if that person goes out, gets that girl drunk, and by means of getting her drunk, gets laid, what is that called? Sexual assault. Okay? And so, consequently, right here is where bystander intervention needs to happen. That's what they call it. And we need to say, hey, look, <laughs> that's, uh, that's an idea. But what we've got to do is realize that if you were to do that, and she would not be consenting... And even if she said yes in a drunken state, you would be opening yourself up for the possibility that this could end very, very badly for you. You just did an intervention. 
and that's what's called a sexual assault intervention. And you can get your buddy the heck out of that bar and get him to do something else if, you're, if you really think that he's going to carry out that plan, right? All I'm doing, thought turned into language, and I intervened, okay? If I'm having trouble with my adolescent son at home, and if I tell you, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm having so much trouble with this kid, I think I'm just going to, I'm just getting ready to deck him, right? I'm just getting, we're, we're getting ready to go out in the backyard and have it out, right? Well, if he goes home and gets in a fist fight with his 14-year-old son, what is that called? <laughs> it's called assault and domestic violence, and he's going to end up spending the night in an orange jumpsuit and flip-flops that match. True story. And so, as that person's just blowing off steam, they might not mean it, they might mean it, okay? But as thought turns into language, we intervene, okay? So can you see that already we're beginning to map by listening and intervening as far to the left as possible? Uh, hey, is this person at risk for domestic violence? Is the spectrum coming up this way to domestic violence? Is it coming this way to sexual assault? Is the person at risk for something else? And then if we listen carefully, we might find them that they might be at risk for suicide if we're listening carefully enough. Now... Give me an example of a statement of despair. What would be a real-life statement that someone might say if they were in despair? Can you give me an example? Just anybody? Yeah. I just want everything to go away. Excellent example. Somebody else? Yes. I've made a terrible mistake. I've made a terrible mistake. Another example. I'm done. One more, maybe. What's the purpose of living? Okay? Now, on that last statement, we could hear that maybe this person is really in a despair. But how about the previous statements? Are we sure that that person is at risk for suicide? No. Absolutely not. So what do we do if we're not sure? Ask. We ask. Okay? And some of you have already learned and some of you know the acronym R-A-C-E, right? What does the R stand for? Do you remember? Recognize. Recognize, exactly. And the A we just covered, that's the ask. And then the C is what? Care. That's right. And when do we stop caring? <laughs> Never stop caring. And what's the E? Does anybody remember? Escort. Escort. And that's taking them to the right person for the right help. The reason why we talk about spectrum mapping is because we got to figure out where they're headed first, right? And then depending on where they are headed, we're going to get them the right escort to the right place at the right time. All right, and if it's, a, if it's at risk for suicide, are we going to leave them alone in that escort process? No, absolutely not. We're going we're gonna to do a direct handoff with somebody who can help them. Okay, would you slide down, and I'm going to bring another volunteer up. We're going to talk a little bit more about accelerators. Okay, next person right here. Yep. Okay. And this person has an anger problem. Okay. And that, that is something that they carry with them. That is a risk factor for this individual. Okay, so not only does this person like to drink, but this person also has an anger problem. And that gives them kind of a quick, reactive trigger figure, finger, right? So they are, they're always reacting. And that's something that becomes a risk factor that we'll have to take into account. Slide down one more. I'll take my last volunteer. And these are not the only three accelerators. This just gets us thinking about accelerators. And this person w would represent some kind of a history. So if we're talking about suicide, it might be a history in the family of suicide, right? So that when things get really bad, we start thinking about what other people did when things got really bad for them. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So the reason why we talk about accelerators is this. On a professional level, I challenge you to get in touch with the things that are accelerators in your life. What is it that causes you to move quickly to consider some kind of a culminating event, right? Regardless of what that event might be, even if it's something that could put yourself or someone else in jeopardy. Because just as we have accelerators, we also have decelerators. And the decelerators are the people in my life and the things that I do that are healthy, that are healthy for me and that help me to move back to the left into a healthy place. Does that make sense? Okay, awesome. And one more thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say before I have you all sit down. And that is that when we think about our, our, our 
required training and we think about things like suicidal ideation, I just wanted to point out that suicidal ideation takes place along this spectrum right here between thought and language. This is where ideas are generated. Between language and action, we might start to, to make preparatory decisions, right? And we might actually do some things that are self-harm, that are violent toward ourselves, that are maybe not necessarily suicidal, but they might be suicidal, but taking some kind of action against ourselves. And then suicidal attempts happen here between action and the culminating event. So whenever we see anything that looks like that in our fire teams, we want to make sure we get those people the help that they need. But the most important thing is what we've done just now, to listen carefully right here and to find out, hey, where are they headed, right? And which direction is this person headed? By asking good questions, by listening carefully, we might find out that the spectrum is headed toward a problem like financial hardship or, or divorce or sexual assault or domestic violence or it could be suicide. And if it's something like suicide and we ask a good question that's direct and to the point, a question like, are you considering suicide? Are you thinking about ending your life by suicide. We ask a direct question like that. Whenever the answer is yes, right, we have to do what? Take action. And we have to escort them. And we have to get them the help that they need. All right, would you all have a seat? Appreciate your help very, very much. Okay, so as I close, and we think about this, the idea that there could be a variety of places and risk factors and we want to have the ability to really intervene and figure out how can we best help and escort. We think about that race acronym again. Over here is all about recognition, asking the right questions, never stopping our process of caring for the people in our fire team and then escorting them to the help that they need. All right, so let me ask you this before I close. Why do you think I care about this? Really? Lives depend on it. Lives care. Lives depend on it. All right. Yeah. You've experienced it many times. I've experienced it. Lots of interventions. Okay. And also people that I love, who have, who have ended their lives by suicide. All right. People that I love dearly. Right. Yeah. Uh, people having thoughts of suicide could see this. Okay. People having thoughts of suicide could possibly see this. Right. And get the help that they need. Yeah. It's a growing problem in the U.S. service. Okay. It's a growing problem. Okay, now I'm going to switch it around. Why do you think that I think that you should care about this? All right, why? Because it's not only going around in like U.S. service, but it's actually <coughs> happening in society period. Okay, not only in U.S. service, but in society period. Thank you. Yes. Well, being in the service, is it's like very likely you'll encounter this person. It is very likely you'll encounter it. Yes. Because it's more effective if a lot of people know how to prevent it versus. If, I, if it's just me, who cares, right? How effective could that be? Thank you. Okay, so more, more people, greater effectiveness. Yeah? Uh, I think it's happening a lot in our age. Okay. So you might have an ability to communicate in a way that I can't. Okay? That's absolutely, that's perfect. And that meets exactly the purpose of this training. And that is, I can't get to your fire team. And so I need you to partner with me. In every place that you go, we can't send chaplains. We can't send mental health professionals to all those places. So that's why I see you as my partners in this work because we can't get to where you'll go. So if we equip you with better fire team leadership skills, we're going to be a lot safer and we're going to be a suicide safe Marine Corps. And that's the effort that we're constantly working toward. All right, so keep fighting because you keep training and take care of the people in your fire teams, and we'll be good. Thank you very much for your attention. God bless you. Ra. Ra. Ra.